Welcome to PPR podcast number 189. My name is Paul Rudy, but the man to my right is the star of the podcast and of the Prep Pigskin Report in general, Mr. Bert Grossman, everybody. Never mind his funny wearing his underwear on the outside of his trousers. He's actually a very knowledgeable <laughs> football wow, You just can't let it. Uh, uh, Bert, we have a very special guest who reached a milestone of sorts. So would you like to introduce? Coach Ron Hamamoto from Monte Vista. Well, a lot of high schools, but presently... Monta Vista. Monta Vista. And he joins us now, number tied for fourth on the all-time wins list. Coach, you are in some rarefied air. Congratulations. What's the number at right now? I don't know. I don't pay attention to that stuff. Well, it's two-something. I'll look it up. You're tied with the legendary Benny Edens for fourth on the CIF San Diego section all-time list. I believe it's 298. No, is it really that high? Yeah, I think. Or, no, not 298. It's 238. 238. Yeah, that's uh, that's 238. 230. 238 wins, coach. Which one stands out the most? Well, 238. That just means that I'm an old guy that I've been around for a long time. Uh, you know, there there's been a lot of, you know, memorable moments. But uh, you know, I would just have to say it's the whole process. You know, it's the journey. Uh, you know, I've worked with a lot of great coaches, you know, and it's not about me. It's it's about the players that have played for me. It's about the coaches that coach with me. Um, nobody can do it by themselves. So, you know, I'm just very fortunate. I've been surrounded by some great people throughout the years. But let me follow up on that because there's got to be a couple that you've, I mean, when, when you're uh, walking the dog or whatnot that you think back on. What is there a... Is there a game maybe that you didn't think you were going to win that you won, or a game you thought you were going to win and you lost? Of, of those 238 wins, if you could only if you could live one of them over again, which one would it be? Well, you know, I think anytime you you win a CIF title, you know, uh, you know it, it's pretty special. You know, you you try to go, you know, the whole season and you try to keep winning and most teams will lose their last game. But when you win that last game and win a CIF title, I mean, I, I think those are pretty special. But honestly, uh, every place that I've been at, you know, every school that I've been at, it's been some special people that I've worked with. And uh, all my best friends are coaches right now. So, you know, um, obviously that says something about, you know, all the time that we've spent together, whether it's going to clinics, breaking down film, game planning, practice planning, or whatever, it's, it's the people that you work with that, that, you know, are really special to me. I was looking at the thing and, and you know, the list is John Carroll and then like you're 10 behind him and then you both come from Servite in the 80s. How come we haven't, we have two of the greatest coaches in section history come from Servite in the 80s? How come we don't go to Servite every year and get new coaches? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that was a long time ago. You know, Coach Carroll and I are, you know, pretty old compared to the, the young coaches now. But, uh, you know, he, that, that was a special time for us. And if you talk to John Carroll, he'll tell you that that was a special time also that, you know, when, when you uh, have to compete in Orange County in the leagues and, you know, that kind of caliber of football and, you know, your name is up there as a coordinator and you get a, a ch chance to be a uh, head coach, you know, uh, especially here in San Diego. You know, uh, I, I moved down to San Diego, was 1985 and never, never left. You know, very fortunate that, uh, you know, I've had jobs here in San Diego and just just a beautiful city that that you know I'm glad I never left I'm glad my career was here in San Diego because uh, you came in 85 right 1985 yeah. so uh, always my question of how because I played in 85 as my senior in high school and football has changed so much I mean not just the playbook but the weight training I mean you remember back in the day it'd be like three days of leg or upper body two days of legs and we all did the standard whatever colleges around you weight program is it I mean, because you have to adapt so much. I mean, is that a hard thing to do? Or is because I, I still am stuck in the same old like stuff. But it seems like every year, every three years, you have to keep adapting and adapting and adapting. Do you have to do that, or you just bring in younger guys? A uh, little of both. You know, I, I have some really young guys on my staff that uh, you know, uh, you know, can do things that let's say like I can't do. Like I don't, I'm not on social media or you know, any of that stuff, but I have some really good guys that are on my staff that do that. But for, for the most part, you know, football comes down to blocking and tackling. And to do that, you have to have a weight program. Uh, we, we've been lifting weights at every one of my pro programs, you know, every high school, 
Uh, we've been on the Bigger, Faster, Stronger program for many years here, you know, at, at this high school and in other high schools. And so I think, you know, the bottom line is the fundamentals don't change, you know, the blocking and tackling. And but uh, but, yeah, there are certain things that change as times goes on. And, and you know, you're seeing, you know, a lot more you know, spread offenses and get the ball out in the open area, you know, to get players to play, you know, one-on-one -on -one in the open area. You know, we're in the 90s. There were, you know, I would say, you know, 20-something schools here running the wing tee. You know, and when I got here in 1985, Ed Burke and myself were the only two guys running the wing tee. You know, and then by the 90s, it just exploded. And then, you know, uh, then the spread offense came in. And so, you know, the... Football, you know, like you guys know, goes in cycles and, you know, um, I don't know what the next cycle is, but, you know, right now it's it's changed from, you know, every decade. And, yeah, we have to adjust. But, you know, that that's what makes coaching so fun, too. Is, is that influenced by what college coaches are doing and high school athletes want to be want to make it to the next level? So they want to showcase skills that they're seeing at the collegiate level. Is that the big influence of changing X's and O's? Yeah, I think so. But I also think, too, that, you know, as a coach, you have to be comfortable in what you teach and what you coach, and you have to adapt to the personnel that you have. You know, some schools, you know, they're trying to run the spread offense, but they don't have a quarterback, you know, and they wonder why they can't move the ball. I mean, <laughs> you're going to run the spread offense. You better have a quarterback that can sling it out there. Uh, you know, there there's certain fundamentals that don't change in football. You know, uh, Paul Johnson you know, that ran the, the option all the time. When he got the head job at Georgia Tech, you know, about 10, 15 years ago, you know, everybody says, well, nobody's going to go there because you run the option and they don't, you don't run a pro-style offense. But, you know, he still ran the option. And, you know, if you've got athletes, they're going to find them. You know, the pros are going to find them at the college level. The colleges are going to find them at the high school level. So, to me, it doesn't really matter what offense or defense you, you put in as long as you're good at it and it's adaptable to the kids that you have. You know, I, I always, when I first started coaching, I went to Saints and, and it was always, you know, your uni, we just hear stories, you know, Montala you had, you had Doyle, I think Hastings, um, who else did you have on that staff? Any, Jerry Ralph. Uh, what made you leave uni? To, I mean, it seemed like that was like paradise back then. You had a great staff, everything. What made you leave uni to go to Rancho Bernardo? Yeah, but uh, let me let me just say this too that it was a great staff and a lot of those guys are my my closest friends right now, you know. But every school that I've been at, it's been, you know, some really good people that I've worked with and some of my closest friends, you know, are here at Monta Vista, at Lincoln, Rancho Bernardo, Uni, uh, you name it, you know, and but so long story short, the reason I left Uni was, you know, I'll be selfish here, it was the pay. You know, Catholic schools did not pay very well in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, right now there, if you go to Orange County, I mean, and you're a football coach, you know, they pay the greatest amount. They're like Texas high school football coaches, but there's no security. You know, when I took the, the job at Rancho Bernardo and, you know, I got into the public school system and the benefits and everything else, I mean, I'm well taken care of, you know, when, whenever I decide to retire. I mean, that was a big move for me, moving from the Catholic schools to the public schools, you know, probably career wise, you know, you, you look at what Coach Doyle and Coach Montali's done at Cathedral, you know, probably it would have been, you know, if I just was worried about the high school wins, it'd be better if I stayed at uni that turned into Cathedral. But, you know, I, I had to look at out for my, my future too. And, and uh, you know, I'm glad I made the move because like I said, I ran into a lot of quality people that I worked with and, and still work with right now at Monta Vista. I think Montali's still wearing the same dirty hat he wore in uni in the 90s. <laughs> but, but just think what your win total would be at if you had stayed at Cathedral. I mean, uh, I think you'd be at the top of the chart looking down on everybody. Or, or so. I don't know about that. Uh, but, you know, all I know is, you know, they're Montali and Doyle and those guys and everybody over there, they're doing a great job. Uh, I, you know, I'm proud to say that they coach for me and Doyle will pass me up. You know, Doyle will probably be in the 300 mark, you know, and, and Chase and Herb Meyer, you know, because they're, they're going to win 10, you know, over 10 games a year, you know. And right. so uh, we're at Monta Vista right now. And, you know, we're, you know, ever since COVID hit, we're, we're struggling, you know, just to get numbers out. So, you know, I still love coaching, but, you know, we don't, you know, coaching wise, we don't have the numbers that a cathedral will. I was going to ask you that because, you know, every school 
COVID hit a little different. It seems like it really hit you guys. And why um, is that? And why is that? Yeah. That's a good question. I, I don't know other than, you know, I think every community has, you know, uh, certain parents that, you know, when they tell their kids, hey, you're not going to play tackle football and roll around on the grass with this COVID uh, disease going around, you know, and you're not going out for football. There was a couple years where we only had 10 freshmen come out you know, two years in a row. And so we, instead of going with three teams, a freshman, sophomore, JV team, and a varsity team, you know, we just combined our 10 sophomores with our 10 freshmen and had one small JV team and another varsity team with about 20 people on it. You know, uh, nobody knows why certain schools go through that, but talking to other coaches, you know, everybody's going through that. The numbers are going down. I think the concussion issue hurt high school football. You know, I think uh, the, the COVID disease hurt high school football. And now we're slowly getting back to, to more and more numbers. You know, we haven't gone back to three teams yet. Eventually, I would hope that, you know, here at Monta Vista, we field three teams again, freshman, JV, and varsity, like a lot of schools. But for whatever reason, we just haven't, uh, you know, back in 2017, when, when we won the CIF with McClendon and, and you know, all the kids that, you know, I have in college right now, you know, we were we were on a high, but then, you know, it's high school football coaching is like that. Sometimes you have talent and sometimes you don't. But I like to always say that the good ones, you know, just hang in there and keep coaching. You know, they don't quit and walk away. You know, Sam Blaylock, the baseball coach at Rancho Bernardo, the legendary coach, would always tell me that we're lifers. You know, we're going to keep coaching whether we got talent or not, whether we, you know, things go good or things go bad. We just every year we just keep plugging away and keep coaching kids that, you know, that would, that are at our school. So, um, you know, I'm kind of proud of that. Yeah, I want to follow up on that because what you're enduring now is, reminds me of what Troy Starr was enduring when he left Helix to go to Mount Miguel. And, he, and I talked to him, you, you go from having this preeminent program to a program that's struggling to have, have enough kids on the sidelines. And he goes, yeah, yeah, go, Paul, I get it. You know, maybe we're not going to get championship hardware, but this is what, this is coaching at its purest form where you're really, you're not teaching football players, you're teaching boys to become men and, and the football is just kind of a auxiliary to that or a ancillary to that. Is, can you relate to that? Is, is that what it is right now or do you still one day have in the back of your head dreams of uh, one more CIF title at whatever division it might be? Well, I think, you know, every time you coach, you know, your goal at the beginning of the year is to, you know, go as far as you can and obviously win a CIF title. But, you know, like I said, the, the good football coaches, you know, we're out here for more than wins and losses. You know, we're out here, you know, you know, like you said, you know, making uh, sure that, you know, these boys turn into men but and good people. But, you know, I, I think, you know, our society needs guys that are, you know, and women, too, that are, you know, looking out for the best of their kids. You know, we 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 track their academics. We you know, if if they're hurting in the classroom, if a teacher, you know, emails me and says so and so is screwing around in class, you know, we run them at practice, you know, different things like that. We're we're here to help the parents you know, raise their kid and make them turn out to be better people than if they didn't play football or another sport. And I think, you know, that's a big key right there. I think too many people get caught up on the wins and losses and, you know, and it's nice. It's it, uh, Trust me, you know, I'd like to win the CIF every year and have winning teams. But, you know, I think the real coaches know that, you know, as coaches, Rocky Long, when he was the head coach at San Diego State, used to say this all the time. He says, as a football coach, I haven't won one game. Now, football coaches can lose games with their organizations or, you know, their decisions they make. But, you know, players win games, you know. And so, you know, out of the 200 and some wins that I've had, you know, hey, they've been because I've had great players, you know, that are better than the competition we play. And I've had great coaches that, you know, put them in the right spot. So, you know, there's... Like I say, you know, this is this coaching stuff is is all a process. You know, it's not just, you know, just looking at the end and championships. But is it that and, and sadly, I agree with you, but is that become like a dying breed, especially around the metropolitan areas? Because we always follow college. College is transfer portal now. College is media days and, you know, taking pictures in front of a Lamborghini and recruiting <laughs> and everything else. And high schools yeah. become that now. I mean, it's pretty much the yeah. same thing now. 
they haven't done the NIL yet, but but that's going to be they're, next. No, they're getting there. They're getting there. So, I mean, how much longer yeah. do you stay in? Because it doesn't become fun that way anymore. Well, you know, to me, it's it's still fun because it's a high school level, and we haven't gone on to see a lot of that. Like Nick Saban's, you know, he's famous for saying, you know, hey, after my last game, you know, we went in the locker room, and instead of talking about next year and how we're going to work hard. Everybody was talking about how much you're going to pay me to stay here. And he just said, I know that's time to get out. And I know eventually that'll happen to me at the high school level. It'll be eventually is it's just time to go, you know, but right now I'm still, Oh, there goes the bell. Don't Sorry worry about, about it, that. Coach. But, but, you know, right now it's still fun for me. It's, it's the high school level. We haven't been hit by NILs. We, you know, the transfer portal, yeah, it's really hurt high schools because there's a lot of more kids transferring now than there's ever been. I know CIF could tell you that, you know, the rules are, the statistics are that, you know, it's not very much, but, you know, you, you can just look out there and see if people are transferring. So, you know, I, yeah, right now, I, you know, I'm still having fun, you know, and, and I think it's it's due to the people that are around me, you know, the players, the coaches, the parents, you know, uh, you know, their their administration, they're real supportive here at, at Monta Vista, and so I'm uh, I'm still having fun. Well, you know, we left one out, we left one step out because we talked about the transfer from Uni to RB, but why RB to Monta? Mon Lincoln. When, okay, yeah, walk us through that because all the steps. So why RB to Lincoln and then why Lincoln to Monta Vista? Well, when I left RB to go to Lincoln, okay, there was, first of all, I had been at Ranch Bernard for 11 years and sometimes you just get that itch. I was younger at the time and, and they offered me the head football job and an athletic director position. So, you know, and it was in, you know, the city of San Diego, which is, you know, closer to where I live. And so, you know, I, I just thought, you know, I'd take a shot, you know. And then when I left Lincoln, I actually went to Mesa College to become the defensive coordinator. They had promised me a full-time job. And, uh, you know, when the older you get, a lot of times you look at those community college jobs and you say, you know, this would be a great thing to do instead of, you know, teaching five classes a day. You know, those college coaches, they teach, you know, Monday, Wednesday or Tuesday, Thursday classes. And, you know, it's a ghost town on Friday. So, you know, the, you're, you're, you're teaching, you know, during the day, especially during, you know, not football season. You are, you know, um, not, you know, I would say putting in as much time as teaching as, you know, as a high school teacher would. So I looked at that, but then there were budget cuts that came up. And so after a year, they said, you did a great job as defensive coordinator, but, you know, we, we don't have a full-time job for you. So I looked for another job and fortunately Monta Vista was open and I took this job and been here for 13 years. I feel very fortunate that, you know, I, again, I didn't have to leave San Diego all these years. Even when I tried that year of college coaching, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to stay in San Diego and not a lot of football coaches can say that. A lot of them are packing their bags and, and traveling all around the country. And it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm very fortunate. I got to stay in San Diego my whole career. Did you succeed Ed Carberry there? No, uh, it was, uh, Paige Culver. He is my, uh, you know, defensive coordinator and offensive line coach right now. He still teaches here. We teach PE together, but, Carberry was, I want to say, one coach before, I think he was the coach before uh, 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 Coach Culver took over. And then when Coach Culver uh, resigned, I took over. Because Carberry's days, I mean, Monta Vista, but man, they were hammer and tong. They were a hard-nosed uh, CIF contender. Yeah, they were. But you got to remember at that time, too, that uh, Monta Vista was, I think, around 2,400, 2,600, where, you know, uh, schools like Steel Canyon and people like that weren't uh, around yet. So, you know, the district was a, a little bit smaller and you, you could draw the schools were a little bit bigger. Um, so, you know, Coach Carberry did a great job here. You know, I'm not taking anything away from him. So, you know, and he had a great staff here. He had great players here, um, you know, but... Uh, Sorry, here comes the tardy valve. <laughs> don't worry about it. We don't even hear it. Yeah, we don't even hear it on our end, Coach. So oh, you don't hear yeah, it. Yeah, no, don't, don't sweat it. And and I lived, I, to that point, I lived in uh, the South Bay, and, and East Lake used to dominate. And then all of a sudden, Otay Ranch opens, Olympian opens, Modern Day opens, and they're all within like a stone's throw of each other. 
and you dilute the product, and now everybody in the South Bay is diluted, and there's no good football team. All right, Coach Robert, just a few more questions, uh, if you will. So uh, I, I guess I want to get back to that proliferation as, as more schools come on, the, the you're seeing some kids flocking to certain programs, leaving others. You have no control over it. Do you just kind of go about your merry way and you you wait for that once in a generational team where the neighborhood kids get together and you have a lot of them and a lot of good ones and that's it's kind of like waiting on Haley's Comet. You get that special group and then you do something with them. And in the meantime, you just do your best. Is, is that the mentality of it all? Yes, I believe so because, you know, I have no control over where the kids want to go or go. Um, and, you know, we one one year we're going to have, you know, another Jamon McClendon and, you know, a bunch of guys, you know, come up and, uh, you know, uh, Sebastian Valdez, Blake Schmidt, Logan Schmidt. I mean, we got a bunch of kids, you know, that are, you know, in college right now playing and and, you know, from that team. And, and it's like, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll get them. You know, eventually we'll get there. You know, I think the cycles in you know, high school football go up and down. And, you know, one, one day we'll, you know, Monta Vista, whether I'm here or retired or, or whatever, you know, they'll have a cycle that's up. I, I think, you know, that's part of coaching. But, you know, like I said, if you're a lifer and you just keep coaching, you uh, do the best you can. And if you're a, you know, to me, if you're a real high school coach, you just keep coaching every year. You just keep coaching and, you know, when you don't have very much talent, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, try to go to the board and try to do X's and O's in a certain way just to keep us close in the game. So, you know, I, I think, you know, if you've never had to do that and you've always, you know, coached a team that's 10 and 0, I, I think, you know, you're you're probably missing out on, on being a real high school football coach. But, you know, again, people will argue with me, well, it's all about the wins, but, you know, it's, I think those of us that have been around long enough, they know that, you know, it's, it's more than the wins when you're a high school football coach. I got to, when you're inducted into the San Diego Coaching Hall of Fame and they unveil the bust, whose cap will you be wearing? When you, how do you, what school do you identify with as Ron Hamamoto from blank school? Because you can only wear one cap. What are you? What, do you see, are you now a monarch, or do you see yourself still as a Don? What, how do you identify yourself as, if you could only have <laughs> identify yourself well, as one school? Well, the good news is it's not the Hall of Fame or anything where you have to wear a hat or anything. Where it's, it's you know, you wear a suit and tie, and you <laughs> just, you know, you don't wear any hats I at know, all. I know, but you get where I'm going with the question. Where, where do you I know, I know, but, you know, the, the thing is, is that, you know, I have not been at one school long enough to do that. You know, Monta Vista, this being my 13th year, is the longest I've been at a school. You know, I was at uni for 11 years. I was at Rancho Bernardo for 11 years, Lincoln for four years. Uh, you know, and so long story short, I mean, I, I think, you know, every uh, place that I've been at is special to me. You know, um, to answer your question, maybe I get a hat, you know, like, you know, like some of those parents wear a jersey, you know, that's split down and because they have two sons playing or whatever. <laughs> Maybe I get a hat that has a four or five way logo on it. I don't know, but you know, I can't answer that question because I have too many good friends at every place that I've been at. Coach, just wear a Mesa hat, man. Make it easy. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to worry about any of that. Then. That's, that's the least uh, time that I've been in any place. You know, I was just there for one season. <laughs> uh, uh, hey, uh, can I ask you, you've seen a lot of, I, I ask this of every guest. Uh, you've seen a lot of weird things happen on the football field. When you were sitting around having a beer with your coaching friends, what's the thing that puts the biggest smile on your face or the story you like to tell the most about something crazy on the football field that you've endured or, or seen? What, what, what's your fondest memory? That I was Paul Rudy's first interview of a high school football coach on the PPR. You know, we used to keep the lights on at, at Rancho Bernardo High School when you first got here your first year. And, you know, everybody would be gone except for the janitors, you and me and the, and the crew, of, you know, that came driving up in that van that we would be doing. That's when PPR was only, I, I believe, the, like the last 15 minutes of the newscast. Sure. And you did, 
you know, I think that your first year you did three interviews with me, uh, live shots, you know, on the KUSI news. And and for whatever reason, that first year you loved, you know, coming to Rancho Bernardo, you know, and but uh that probably is, you know, because I told Bert already that I'm a big fan of PPR. You know, I, I don't miss it. And, you know, when I retire, I, I still won't miss it. I love high school football and seeing what everybody's doing. And, you know, and I was the first guy that you ever interviewed. So I, I think that's pretty special. Well, Ron, because nobody else would talk to him. The only one said yes. That's the only reason. <laughs> You know, sorry, you're, sorry. You're, your contract is year to year, and it could be day to day, dude. Um, coach, I, I told that story this morning. To me, on, uh, actually. Did I tell it to you? You did tell it to me, yeah. Oh, you said it was foggy. Yeah, it was, I remember it was a real foggy day. The live shot was microwave, truck couldn't see the signal, and, and we got it on. I know you, you wanted to be anywhere but there, but you were so gracious with your time. <laughs> and the reason why we were doing RB is you were great that year. You were good. <laughs> mm hmm. All right, well, Coach, uh, uh, moms and dads ask you about what, if their son should play football. They're concerned about injuries. Uh, give that speech or that talk that you have with moms who are legitimately concerned about the safety of their kids and the health of their kids, don't want to poo-poo it. So I want you to, how do you address it when moms and dads ask you about it? Well, the first thing is, is I tell them that you are absolutely correct. I mean, the worst thing about this sport is the injuries, okay? I hate it when a kid gets injured. You know, I tell my team before every game that, you know, or before every season that, you know, I say a little prayer before every game and I pray that there's no injuries on either team, you know, our opponents or us, and I pray that our boys play well. I never pray for wins and losses or anything like that. But the worst thing is injuries. So if a mom tells me I don't want my kid playing because, you know, the injuries in, in football, I say, you know, you have every right to do that, you know. But I also tell them, too, that, you know, if you just listen to Coach John Carroll, you know, talk, you know, uh, he, he, he did one segment on the PPR where, you know, all the advantages of football, you know, as far as, you know, not only just being part of a team, but the discipline, you know, making the, the kid a better person, you know, there's a lot of positives, you know, here to, and I won't go into all of them, you know, like, like Coach Carroll did, but, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a family decision and I'm never going to step in a way of a, a mom or dad that says, hey, this sport is too dangerous, you know, don't play it. But if you look at all the kids and the numbers going up, you know, obviously, you know, there's a lot of parents out there that think that, you know, yeah, there, there's a risk of injury, but the percentages are so low that, you know, we're going to let our kid play because, you know, there's a lot of people that played this game and they got a lot out of it, you know. And so and I worry about our sport, you know, to be honest with you, the way, you know, things are going. But I also know, too, that this is a you know, a sport that, you know, more and more kids are coming out for. So I think that, you know, the, the rules are changing where you're protecting kids. You know, it's it's not, you know, now with targeting and stuff, you know, I know a lot of defensive coordinators like Montali that get frustrated because if you hit a guy too hard, you get a penalty, you know, and that wasn't the case, you know, in the 80s and 90s, you know, when I first got into coaching. So, you know, a lot of things, you know, I understand what parents are going through, but these are family decisions. You know, I never try to get in in the, the way of a family decision. You know, if you say, you know, my kid's not going out, uh, you know, uh, classic example, we had a offensive lineman last year as a sophomore make all league. You know, he decided this year he's not going to come out. He's going to concentrate on track. He's doing very well in the shot put and discus, and he's not going to. We could certainly use him, but, you know, his family decided that his future is in track, throwing the shot put and the discus, and he's not going to play football. And, and I never argued with him. I said, you know, that's a family decision. You guys do what you need to do, but I'm here to coach the kids that are here, and we're going to try to make it as positive an experience as possible. And on that note, I think that's a perfect place to get out, Coach. Uh, we kept you longer uh, than uh, I think you might be our longest podcast, but uh, it's always an honor to speak with you. And you, you're so humble about your success that just know that anybody who's ever rubbed shoulders with you has nothing but the utmost respect and admiration for Coach Ron Hamamoto. Right back at you, both of you. You know, right. I, I really enjoy the PPR and uh, – you know, I enjoy watching you guys all the time, you know, every Friday night or actually you guys are on so late. I, I have to DVR it and, <laughs> and watch it on Saturday, yeah. you know, 
It's we fast fall, we fall asleep, too. We're not yeah. even awake over there. Just... Well, you might have seen Bert's last show, so uh, yeah. we, we can, next time we talk, we'll be. <laughs> It'll be Jason's and Dory here next time. Don't worry about it. All right, Coach. Podcast number 180. What are we? 199. 189 is over. Turn off your machines. Coach, good luck Friday.